Hello everyone and good morning. In the previous lecture, we have discussed about uh, that uh, how to analyze a transfer lines and uh, how to calculate the performance of the transfer lines. See, uh, we have to uh, calculate uh, the performance on the basis of uh, the efficiency of the transfer line, the downtime, uptime, and uh, all these parameters are uh, necessary to decide the performance of the transfer lines. So today uh, we will discuss about the topic transfer lines with internal storage buffer. So what is internal storage buffer and why it is required? So let us understand this concept. See, uh, in an automated production line, when there is no internal storage of parts, so in that case, the workstations are independent. And uh, when one station breaks down, all other stations on the line are affected, either uh, immediately or by the end of the few cycles of operations. So the workstations will be forced to stop for one or uh, two reasons. Uh, say, for example, the one reason may be the starving of stations and uh, where uh, you can say that we have to stop the workstations and in the second case the blocking of stations so starving on an automated production line means that a workstation is prevented from performing its cycle because it has no part to work on so sometimes what happening uh, when there may be a situation when uh, the cycle time of uh, the stage one is uh, lesser than the cycle time of the stage two. So what happening in that case, we have to synchronize the motion of the parts or the processing time we have to control. In that case, when a breakdown occurs and any workstation on the line, the station downstream from the affected station will either immediately or eventually uh, become a star for the parts. So therefore, what happening in this case, uh, we have to maintain some internal storages so that if the um, second stage part is processed and if there is any delay, then what happening in that case, we have to take the part from the storage buffer and pass on to the stage two. So that if the stage one is taking much time as compared to the stage two, there will be no delay in the stage two. So this is basically used. Next is the blocking. Blocking means that the station is prevented from performing its work cycle because it cannot pass the part it uh, just completed to the neighboring downstream station. So when the breakdown occurs at a station on the line, the station upstream from the affected uh, station uh, become blocked because the broken down station cannot accept the next part for uh, processing from the neighboring uh, upstream station. So therefore, none of the uh, uh, upstream stations can pass their just completed parts of, for work. So by adding one or more part, as I told you that uh, from the storage buffers between the workstation production line can be designed to operate more efficiently. The storage buffers divides the line into two stages that can operate independently for a number of cycles. So you can see here in this figure that uh, the, this uh, a line is divided into two stages and the part is inserted from this end and uh, the process is going on. And uh, if there is any delay between the stage one and stage two, then we have to provide the storage buffer to load the part on the stage two. So you can find out the efficiency of the overall efficiency of the cycle will depend upon the efficiency of the stage one and the efficiency of the stage two. So you can find out the completed part out at the end. So this is the entire arrangement of the plant where you can find out that how the cycle of work is going on either with the help of the automated system or in the assistance of the robots or the transfer line ATVs or etc. So that you can find out that uh, we have to maintain the 
uh, motion of the parts between one and the station two. So therefore, when we consider the number of cycles and uh, the number uh, depending on the storage capacity of the buffer, if one storage buffer is used, the line is divided into two stages. If two storage buffers are used at two different locations along the line, then three stage line is performed. Means because uh, in the earlier case when we considered a single line or single stage, so if you introduce here a single storage buffer, it will be divided into automatically the two stages. Okay. And simultaneously, if you use the two storage buffer in between the line, then this uh, will be divided into three stages. So it can be considered and uh, what happening in that case, if we consider the downtime that can be caused by starving or blocking. So starving differs when the automated production line is prevented from the performing its cycle because of the absence of a part to work on. So we are, we, you know that how to calculate the downtime as described above can be reduced by adding one or more parts. So the storage buffer between the workstation downtime as described can be reduced by adding one or more part storage buffer between the workstations. So if there is any delay between the workstation one and between the workstation two, we have to supply uh, some more parts from the storage buffer. So as you know that the storage buffer divides the line into two stages that can operate independently for a number of cycles, the number depending upon the storage capacity of the buffer. So if suppose, as I said that if you are using a single uh, one storage buffer is used, automatically this line is divided into two stages. If two storage buffer are used at different workstation, the line is segmented into three stages and so forth. So therefore, when we are talking about the n stage line, there will be n minus one storage buffer. Or you can say that if there is a n minus one storage buffer, then this is uh, n stage line or not including the raw parts inventory at the front of the line or finished part inventory at the end of the line. So what happening, we have to eliminate all these two uh, considerations that we will not include here the initial part where the raw material inserted and inventory will not be considered or the finished part inventory at the end of the consider. So this will not be considered while the analysis of the transfer line efficiency or transfer line performance. Therefore, it should be clear that we have to introduce the internal storage buffer to reduce the idle time of the machines. So for the analysis purpose, we have to make certain assumptions here that uh, uh, the assumption that the ideal cycle time TC is the same for all stages is great means you have to calculate this ideal cycle time for uh, the stage one, stage two, stage three, and so on. And uh, this ideal cycle time should be common for both the stages if the similar type of production is going on or any type of assembly is uh, going on in the production line. So if there is no storage capacity and there is uh, only one stage to the automated production line, when a station breakdowns, the entire line stops. So this is also happening because uh, what happening if any stage is having a, a problem, then what happening the overall production line will be stopped. So therefore, it, we have to make some arrangement in that case so that it should not be stopped. So it can be uh, rewritten here the line efficiency of the zero capacity storage buffer. It means if there is no storage buffer storage, then this equation will be just as same as we have discussed in the last lecture that E equals to TC upon TC plus F into TD. As I told you that the TC is the ideal cycle time and this TC plus FTD is the average production time where F into TD is, TD is the downtime and F is the frequency of the down. So therefore, we can calculate here the 
average production time so therefore you can calculate the value of ec here so other theoretical case is that when the automated production line with infinite capacity of storage buffer so in that case we have to calculate the idle cycle time as as i already considered in here that uh, it is same for all stages so then the efficiency of the a stage k is given by this equation so that you can calculate the efficiency of the uh, line with the storage buffer so here the k is used to, to uh, identify the stages if there are four stages then you have to identify the fourth stage right so you can calculate the here so the overall line efficiency is given by e eta equals to minimum of ek means this we have to calculate for the stage so for example if we are using four stage stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 stage 4 so if suppose if you are calculating the efficiency of the stage 4 right so that this stage we can calculate ek and similarly we have to calculate the efficiency of uh, the stage 1 2 and 3 and we have to decide here the minimum value of ek it means you have to compare the efficiency 1 2 3 4 and so on and decide here the minimum value of ek so therefore k is equals to 1 2 3 and so on as i told you that there may be a number of stages so that you have to calculate the minimum value of the ek now uh, the theoretical upper and lower limits of the storage buffer when applied to automated production lines the actual value of the line efficiency for a given buffer capacity b falls somewhere in the middle so as i told you there may be a maximum number of uh, uh, you can say that uh, buffers or there may be a zero type of buffer it means there is no buffer so for the given type of uh, line arrangement you can calculate here eb and it will be automatically falls between the zero and the infinity so therefore if let uh, f1 and f2 equal the breakdown rates f1 means it is the frequency and uh, for uh, one stage and the second stage if there is a equal uh, the breakdown rates for the stages 1 and 2 respectively the breakdown rates are not necessarily equal it is not always uh, true that it is not uh, the consider that breakdown rates are equal right so in the long term both stages have equal efficiencies so since if stage 1 efficiency is greater than efficiency for the stage of 2 this would simply lead to a built up of its storage buffer to its capacity so it means that if the efficiency of 1 is greater than the efficiency of 2 it means you can say that there is a possibility that at a stage 1 the part will be finished before then the stage 2 so this is basically leading the built up of the storage buffer to its capacity and thereafter it would be blocked until rebuilt by stage 2 similarly if stage 2 efficiency is greater than the efficiency stage 1 uh, the stage 2 would eventually be starved at its buffer is becomes depleted so what happening in this case if the stage 2 efficiency is greater than the efficiency 1 it means the efficiency means if the stage 2 perform its uh, uh, process uh, quickly than the stage 1 it means what happening here we have to provide the buffer right so in this case the overall line efficiency for the is two stage can be expressed with the help of this equation so eb equals to e0 plus b1 dash h b into e2 so what is the meaning of this in this case we can calculate here that eb is the overall line efficiency for the two stages because we have to consider here the downtime also and we have to consider here the buffer so e0 in that case is the line efficiency for the same line with no internal storage it is just like a previous equation so you can calculate e0 plus f into uh, td right 
So therefore, uh, we can calculate uh, that uh, this A0 is basically the line efficiency, right? With the same line with no installer buffer. But we have to consider this additional value which represent here the improvement in the efficiency that results from having a storage buffer with B is greater than zero, right? So therefore, we have to use here some storage buffer and this storage buffer calculation can be done that how much uh, value is required. So D1 can be calculated separately, which is uh, known as the proportion of total time that stage one is down, means at what time the stage one is down, right? And uh, you can say that, uh, uh, for example, we can calculate this with the help of this equation, T1 dash equals to F1 TD divided by TC plus F1 plus F2 into TD. So F1 and F2 are the frequency of the downtime of stage one and stage two. So it is just like a previous equation, you can calculate here the efficiency of the two, uh, you, sorry, efficiency not. This is the frequency of stage one and stage two. So you can calculate the frequency of stage one and stage two. We can find out the downtime D1 dash. So on the basis of this, you can decide the efficiency of the second stage. Now, uh, partial automation is an automation which is is not completely or you can say that there are some operations uh, which are considered to be difficult and you can say it uh, may be uneconomical um, for example the alignment assembly inspection etc so this is basically evaluation based see a company has to take the decision on the basis of their working or the processing. First, he has to analyze the plant very carefully. On the basis of this, he has to go for the decision whether he has to go for the full automation or partial automation. So partial automation is the evaluation based, right? So therefore, on the basis of this, we can identify that how many operations can be done manually so that we cannot go for the full automation. Say, for example, I have shown here that some assembly operations or inspections. See, inspections is also a time taken activity and sometimes the robots uh, may take more time as compared to the human being, right? So human being can check the uh, or inspect the uh, parts very quickly as compared to the robots, right? So in that case, we can save the money here also and we can go for the partial automation. In that case, the total line cost can be calculated in uh, this CL equals to NOCO plus NACAS plus CAT. So in that case, we have CO is the operator cost per manual station. See what happening, we have to provide some operators and this cost must be included for the calculation of the total line cost because it is not fully operated, it is partially automated. So CAS is the cost per automated workstation rupees per minute. Then CAT is the cost per minute of the automated transfer mechanism which will be used for both manual and automated station to transfer the work part. So NA in this equation is used is the number of automated work station and NO is the number of manually operated work stations. So as I said that in the total uh, work stations, there are some automated work stations and some uh, 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 stations are manually operated. So we have to calculate the total number of work station on the line, which is equal to NA plus NO. So the average production time can be calculated with the help of uh, this uh, method that ideal cycle time plus average downtime per cycle. So this we can calculate with the help of this equation TP equals to TC plus TD into F. This is the previous equation. Now in this equation, we have to calculate here TC plus NAP into TD. So NA, you know that it is the number of automated workstations. 
and p is the probability of part programming at particular station sorry part jamming at particular station right so uh, this is basically we have to calculate the how much matlab time will take for the part jamming at the work stations so uh, this is uh, calculation is needed for the calculation of the average production time so uh, it may be also noted that the breakdown time uh, occurs at uh, automated work stations only because uh, uh, in the case of manual work stations there may not be a much uh, you can say that uh, breakdown occurs but in the case of automated work station there are so many factors which are involved as uh, we have already discussed in the previous lectures for uh, example the line breakdown you can say the maintenance breakdown maybe uh, you can say that delay time due to the part finish at consecutive uh, you can say that uh, stations so there are several uh, factors which were involved uh, for the calculation of the breakdown in the work stations now uh, till now whatever we have covered i would like to take a small review that uh, the automated uh, production line consists uh, of uh, distributed work stations which are connected by the mechanized work transport system that moves the part from one work station to another as they are uh, they enter the system right so what happening in the uh, automated production lines we have to analyze that uh, how these systems are interconnected and what mechanism is used right so uh, this is basically known as the mechanized work transport see the human efforts are mechanized with the help of some elements is known as the mechanization of the work so this is we have to calculate now the condition that determines the use of automated production lines included high product demand stable product design long product life and multiple operations see we have to decide the production on the basis of the sale of the product in the market or you can say the demand what is the product demand right then if there is any high demand then we have to increase the production means suppose if as i told you that uh, if you want to provide the uh, in auto, auto auto automobile industry if you are committed to deliver a car within the next 6 month or you have set the target date then accordingly you have to chase up your production right you have to increase your production you have to uh, find out that uh, what is the um, pro stable product design and uh, how you can manipulate it then long product life right and uh, on the multiple operations we have to find out the automated production line conditions in automated production unprocessed part i enter the production line and undergo a system of automated processing at uh, various work station along the fixed production line with parts being moved from one work station to the next by means of mechanized work transport system until the last process occurs to the part at the final work station in the system at which point the part exits the automated production lines right so what happening in this case there are some unprocessed parts also which uh, enter the production line and uh, undergo a system of automated processing at various work stations see if there is a fixed production line there is no flexibility then what happening in that case we have to consider this unprocessed part also next is the automated production may consist uh, of uh, besides automated work stations manual work stations and inspection stations as i told you that uh, there are uh, some Uh, you can say that not fully automated system there may be a partial automated system uh, and then the automated production will be considered on the basis of some manual work stations and there are some automated work stations and the inspection stations so uh, what happening the inspection stations are also as i told you some time manual operated so we have to consider this station also in number of system configuration for the automated production line exist these includes inline configuration segmented inline configurations 
for uh, example l shaped layout u shaped layouts and rectangular layout and uh, rotary configuration as i told you there are some uh, inline configurations of the line system means all the lines are in straight sometimes there are some bands for example l shaped layout sometimes uh, there may be a u shaped layout as i have shown you in the previous uh, picture as i show you that here uh, okay this uh, you can see that here this is a straight line but the, the, it is necessary to bend so what happening we have to provide this 90 degree band here in this case it is turned and uh, here also required to bend and then it will move further straight and uh, for a long distance and then it will again bend and it will move at for a length distance so we will try to minimize the bending of this line in the case of in line type of system right so the rollers are used to accelerate the motion of the parts on it then the transfer mechanism in the work part system may be synchronous and asynchronous yes this is also because uh, we have to provide the synchronous uh, system or asynchronous system for the transfer mechanism where the part is needed to be transferred now linear transfer system as we have already discussed we have to use the power roller conveyors belt conveyors chain drive con uh, conveyors and uh, part on track conveyors as well as the walking beam transfer systems walking beam transfer means which is used to uplift the uh, parts and uh, move forward uh, the parts by uplift, up, uplifting and downlifting so this is used Geneva mechanism may be used to drive rotary indexing machine and uh, it is used as a continuously rotating driver to index the table through a partial rotation. So as you know that Geneva mechanism is a mechanism which is indexed. So indexed means uh, we required some bell period where the bell period means the stationary period where the actual processing on the uh, part is going on. So this is uh, we have to use with the help of this mechanism and this is the beauty of the mechanism which can provide the dwell period where you understand that when the nail of this mechanism there is a continuous disc which rotate at a constant speed and there is a index type of uh, another disc where the this uh, nail which is attached with the uh, circular disc and this will inserted in the slot so on the basis of this you can find out the intermittent motion next is the cam drive mechanism cam is used to provide the bell motion of the uh, follower so at that time what happening because uh, cam you understand the uh, used to convert the rotary motion into the reciprocating motion and it is so designed that it has some dwell period well period means where the follower is stationary so where this stationary motion comes we can access the workpiece and process it right so this is uh, you can say slightly uh, relatively expensive uh, for the production purpose but it is used next is the storage buffer a storage buffer as i discussed that we have to use this storage buffer uh, uh, on the automated production lines in manual or automated arrangement so where uh, there is maybe gap between the two stages the storage buffer can uh, use to uh, fill the gap or you can say to minimize the idle time on the machine on the line right so we can uh, pass on a part from the storage buffer to the stage two right if the stage one is taking much time the basic control functions that can be distinguished in the operations of the automated transfer machine includes the sequence control, safety monitoring, and quality control. So these are the basically the control functions as we have already discussed in the previous lectures. That what is the meaning of the sequence control, safety monitoring, and quality control? Then uh, the transfer line consists of a number of workstations containing machining workheads arranged in uh, inline or segmented inline configuration with the parts being moved between the stations by various types of transfer mechanisms. Then uh, the a rotary transfer machines uh, which consist of a horizontal circular work table 
upon which the fixed and the work part are to be processed and around those periphery are located stationary work heads so what happening in this case the rotary transfer mechanism the transfer table is continuously rotated and in that case uh, the operators are fixed in their locations and they are going to process the part right and uh, you can see the actual machining process is done when the table is stationary next is uh, the storage buffer reduced transfer line downtime this is basically the purpose of the storage buffer which can reduce the downtime of the trans uh, transfer line so by reducing the effects of the starving and blocking the storage buffer allow each stage of transfer line to operate with some degree of independence this means that when as i told you that if the say uh, second line completed its uh, work as compared to the stage 1 right so what happening the storage buffer will provide a new part for the processing on the stage 2 so this is basically the advantage of the storage buffer the actual value of the line efficiency for a given buffer capacity falls somewhere between the two extremes of having no stage buffers at all and having buffer of infinite capacity then uh, we have discussed uh, uh, that the overall line efficiency for a two stage line is dependent on the proportion of time on individual stages down so we have to consider the downtime for each stages now suppose if there are two stages we have to calculate the downtime at one stage and downtime at second stage obviously if the similar kind of work is going on at two different stages the downtime should be same right or frequency of the downtime will be same but if it is not there then we have to calculate the separate downtime at each stage and along with this we have to consider that how long the other stage is running with the correcting factor for the assumption that the two stages never break down at the same time so as i told you that uh, 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 we assume that at the two stages having a same breakdown but if it is not there we have to calculate that how much time is taking for each stage right so thank you very much we will stop here and in the next class we will discuss that the upper bound and lower bound of the stages